This is Obesity Control Center once in a while webinar, which we are going to try to do more often. But in the meantime, I want to welcome everybody watching. Uh, we are streaming live through Facebook, uh, YouTube, and many other platforms. Um, so post your questions there, and we will have, have Gloria, our producer, uh, our online producer, uh, forward those questions to us, and then we will be able to answer them. But today, I have a great friend and uh, also collaborator and an ex-patient of mine, direct from the UK. Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we were talking yesterday, and he was using his uh, international accent, so I'm going to present him like he's from the UK. <laughs> Efren Coria. Efren, welcome. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. How's it well, going, man? Yeah, everything okay? All right. After, after my vacation, everything is better, you know? Definitely. Right. And it's been a while. Right. It's been so, what, seven so years. First of all, let's uh, start off with the beginning, which was way be when I met you. Uh, you are a long friend, long time friend of my wife, Cynthia. And uh, then I met you probably, what, over 10 years ago now? Yeah, yeah. Over and how did you guys? And how did you guys? A hundred pounds more, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm very tall. I'm six four, so maybe a hundred a hundred pounds sounds a lot, but I, well, I was I was bigger than than I am right now. But you met uh, Cynthia, my wife, how long ago? Oh, like twenty five years ago. All right, and uh, back then, I imagine uh, you guys were young. Well, you. Young and beautiful. My wife, my wife is all, always young. Uh, and then you guys have had a different uh, lifestyle, activity, etc. And you were more or less a normal weight, right? Oh, yeah, I was actually skinny. I've been skinny for most of my life. But then when I hit like 38, I just started gaining weight. Even though I used to lose weight very easily, like over the over a nice weekend, I would lose like even six pounds maybe back in the days, no? And after, like when I exactly turned 38, I couldn't do it anymore. And I went all diets and everything, and uh, I could lose like maybe five pounds and then gain 10 back right away. So it was a really bad struggle with me. Uh, weight loss so so did that have to do anything with that prize you won uh when you were shopping uh for pasta <laughs> with the barilla prize yeah maybe i i like eating a lot <laughs> a lot of italian food <laughs> T tell us about that uh well um i like to cook right and uh at the office i was working at we normally went to out or to a restaurant to for a christmas dinner and it was kind of expensive sometimes, no? And I offered, well, I cook, I'll cook for you. Just, uh, just pay. We all pay for the, for the um, food, and I will cook it. And then um, I was, it was like a, all that, either Mexican, Italian, or Chinese. Obviously, I wanted Chinese, so, anyways, I was gonna go with Chinese. But then they they made this poll, and everybody uh, decided to have Italian food. And I was, I had like pretty much all the ingredients, but pasta. I was, I was totally meant to uh, cook Chinese. And so I was stuck there and needed pasta because otherwise there is no Italian food with no pasta. So I went to the supermarket and there was this, this girl um, that if you buy four packages of pasta, you would get like a scratch ticket to win a trip to Italy, all paid and like a gourmet um, trip. And well, I bought the four packages and uh, I scratched and everything was there. <laughs> In other words, you won the trip. Where to? Yeah, yeah. yeah we were like um, 16 people and at 11 days to Italy, like Rome, um, Parma, Florence. It was a very nice trip. So they paid your your plane and your everything, everything wow. <clears throat> for the bev uh, alcoholic beverages. 
including a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right so so then um when was it that you said 38 years of age and you started and you couldn't do the how would you diet before how what, what was your diet plan or you just stopped eating and that was it yeah well back then like fasting i could like fast for two days and lose a lot of weight i know it's not the best way but that well, works actually, actually your mama says you that uh you, the most important meal of the day is is your breakfast because you break the fast and then these other concepts that have always been there that you shouldn't fast because it slows down your metabolism but nothing could be further from the truth it actually has science has proved that it's the other way around fasting yeah. has been a part of life from uh, from uh, uh, from a religious standpoint most uh, religions mm -hmm. fast uh, most uh, animals in in the in the wild uh, wild actually they fast because food is not readily available. It's only in these past uh, half a century w where we've been forced to have, the to yeah, had the ability to actually have food readily available inside a refrigerator, etc. So fasting, in fact, is one of the few things that will actually revert metabolic syndrome. And for everybody listening, uh, metabolic syndrome uh, is rampant. Uh, this COVID-19 pandemic is nothing compared to the metabolic syndrome pandemic metabolic syndrome is nothing else than insulin resistance and we all have it there is a recent study that i quote a lot uh, that looked at the u.s adult population and they found that only 12.2 percent of the u.s population is metabolically fit that means that would mean that would imply that sooner or later nine out of ten people are either going to become diabetic they're going to have cardiovascular disease or they're going to have dementia or alzheimer's or have a stroke or die of cancer. Now, having said that, I'm not very far off from the truth simply because I'm stating facts, I'm stating uh, research, but also when you look at the mortality, 33%, 32.3% of the uh, death in the United States is attributable to cardiac disease, cardiovascular disease, and that's acquired cardiovascular disease. Back in the 1930s, They didn't even know what a heart attack was. And now suddenly we're all dropping dead. A third of the population is dropping dead with heart attacks. That's a cause of death, 33%. Another 30 percentage, another third is cancer. So that's almost two thirds of the population. When you add dementia, when you add Alzheimer's, when you add stroke, then you're creeping up to the 80%. A hundred years ago, it was only infectious disease. Uh, that was the stuff that would kill us, but that's been long and handled uh, because of antibiotics and the advances in medicine and pharma, uh, uh, pharmacotherapies, etc. So what we're dealing now is this silent killer that people are not even afraid of. Everybody's afraid of the COVID-19 virus and nobody's afraid of dying from uh, metabolic yeah. syndrome until you get COVID. When are you going to get COVID and it's going to kill you if you have metabolic syndrome? So eight out of 10, nine, almost nine out of 10 people have a higher risk of developing the severe form of the disease because metabolic syndrome is so rampant. But I had to put my 10 cents in there because that's extremely important. This is why weight loss surgery is the best vaccine for metabolic syndrome and of course the best vaccine for the severe form of COVID-19. So going back to your story, man, you were 38 years old and then when was it that you finally said, I can't stand it anymore, I'm going to go look for the best surgeon in the world and then you can find him, so you found me. Exactly. <laughs> and you were right there, actually. <laughs> well, it was like, um, what, seven years ago? I was 42. Um, three and yeah I came um, with my cousin remember we we both needed this uh, he needed it more than I do because he was more uh, he wait, waited more I got this the placation and he got the sleeve the placation helped because remember I was so very skinny that you even told me you stop losing weight anymore <laughs> no more losing weight I was you know focus all the way. I was exercising a lot, um, had, um, doing a so lot. How much, how, how much, how much did you lose with, with the procedure? 
uh, including the pre-op diet, like 115 pounds. Well, you weren't you weren't that bad, man. You you were extremely overweight. The, yeah, yeah. the, the thing is that you're really tall. So from a BMI standpoint, body mass index, which is your height uh, uh, divided with your weight squared, uh, it sounded less, but you were pretty high up there. So somebody's asking online what the difference is between one procedure or the other. I mean, you're not going to know the difference because if I do a, an x-ray study on you or if I send you out to another doctor to do an endoscopy, it looks like you have a sleeve. And ultimately, uh, there's different types of procedures. Uh, the difference, main difference between a sleeve and a plication is one you staple off and with the other one you fold. But they're extremely similar in 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 uh, surgery technique and recovery times and results when do i use more of the plication well when i have younger uh, adolescents like 15 uh, 20 years of age etc or somebody that definitely says no i don't want to go the stapling route but ultimately uh, either procedure is, is is very similar in in recovery times and in results so you lost a hundred and something pounds. That's spectacular. And uh, somebody's asking online, what is something you've been able to achieve or do since losing weight? Well, you know, your life completely changed when, once you lose all that weight. I lost 115 pounds, but I lost also like 10 years, you know? I was like laid back. This is my older me. This is my story. It's going to be close to end. Or, you know, something like that. I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm about to retire. You know, I, I felt like old and, and big. And, but then when you take all that weight off, your state of mind changes. And I was young again. I was doing all the stuff I used to do and didn't do because I was big. So, and from there, you can imagine everything you, you can achieve. Yeah, it was a great around. Well, there's some spectacular pictures before and afters of you uh, that we sent out, but I'll, I'll put some online. But then there's an, a couple of questions that were sent to me yesterday, and it's somebody that's five, 59 years old and, and asks is there con if they're considered too old for surgery or too risky for this surgery. And one of the interesting things is that you're never too old to be healthier. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I constantly talk about metabolic syndrome, which is nothing else than insulin resistance um, and is going to lead not just to excess weight or obesity, it's also going to lead to higher risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer. So basically, the prevention of this has to be done almost when you're born. This is a very long a chronic disease that starts off with your insulin creeping up and 20 years after that happened you're finally going to have the symptoms of higher blood sugar or higher triglycerides or higher cholesterol or higher blood pressure but this all started 20 years before so this is why people should take note if you're already interested in weight loss surgery or if you've had weight loss surgery you have to understand, and I want to make this clear, this is not something that you do in one day and the next day you're done. If you're going to have weight loss surgery, it's going to dramatically change your overall health status. It's going to change uh, all your biomarkers, those things we do, that blood test, and we draw blood and we see your good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, your triglycerides, the ones that can uh, predict cardiovascular disease or you dying of a heart attack. Or a cardiovascular event, uh, higher blood pressure, uh, higher blood sugar, all these things are called biomarkers. And those biomarkers include the circumference of your waist. So excess weight, excess body fat, obesity, and all these other markers immediately get better after having weight loss surgery. In fact, two to three weeks after. But that doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. One of the most important things we were talking about is fasting. And fasting is one of the things that is actually been proven to be good for you. The other thing that's extremely important, and in fact, I've got the recent numbers right now that I'm publishing. Um, and I'm also presenting in Low Carb USA, which is an incredible movement in the U.S. Uh, that is actually uh, headed up by... Doug uh, Reynolds 
and incredible experts, global experts. We're presenting how in over 10,000 patients we've used a therapeutic low-carb restriction program to prep patients for surgery. So anybody who's listening who had surgery actually used the pre-op diet we use, which is a therapeutic low-carb or therapeutic uh, low, uh, carb restrictive uh, program. And what this does, it not only reverts your fatty liver, which is one of the most important things that we want to revert before surgery in a two to three week preparation period before surgery, we also want to revert metabolic syndrome. And what we found out, and right now I'm looking at our study slides. In fact, I'm going to show them to you guys right now. This is awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad I have them right here. Let me see, said the blind man. Uh, these are beautiful slides. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, I'm glad we're having a chance to do this. Uh, let's see. All right, we're ready now. I'm going to share screen. And it's not going to be a perfect slideshow, but I am going to share. So, low carb before and after weight loss surgery. And one of the interesting things is that if you look, bariatric surgery is exposed expressively designed to revert metabolic syndrome. And here you can see how the difference between um, patients that are diabetic and how those that have surgery and that those have, that have conventional treatment, uh, how bariatric surgery is extremely more aggressive in curing diabetes. Now, one of the things that we know is that diabetes can relapse after weight loss surgery. So that's why we put all our patients on low carb. Now, one of the things that we've seen during the period between 2013, 2020, we've done 10,605 surgical patients and 10% of our patients, almost 11% were diabetic. And what we found is that uh, when we put them on a preoperative, pre-surgical uh, diet, what we did is our idea has always been to lose five to 10% of your excess uh, body, not excess body weight, but your total body weight in the first two to three weeks before surgery. And the object, the real objective, objective is to revert metabolic syndrome, uh, which means that you're going to have better blood sugar control, blood pressure control, dyslipidemia control. In other words, your good cholesterol is going to elevate, your lower, bad cholesterol is going to lower, uh, reverse fatty liver. And now that's extremely important because when we go into surgery, we can see that the we reverse the fatty liver and revert or reverse the pro-inflammatory state. Anybody who's overweight or obese or has metabolic syndrome, which is 9 out of 10 adults in the U.S., has a pro-inflammatory state. And when you lose the weight and you start using these tools, which we are uh, talking about, which is intermittent fasting, therapeutic low-carb uh, restriction, and surgery, the disease reverses. And what we found is that, let's go to the, the statistics, in the average uh, 2.5 weeks of a pre-op diet, how long was your diet, uh, Efren? Yeah, like two to three. I lost 30 pounds in two weeks. So, so see, our diabetics lose around 10 pounds, pounds on average, and our non-diabetics like eight pounds on average. But yeah, you were one of the overachievers. So that's very impressive. But surgery, by the time you've done this two to three week diet, your blood sugar, your blood cholesterol, your blood triglycerides are extremely improved. And uh, it's really interesting that our surgical procedures actually have a very permanent, very durable weight loss. Here you can see how most of our patients start off at an average of 40 BMI, and by five years, they're around 26 BMI, and then you don't see too many patients regaining their excess weight. So we're really happy about that. Now, you had a small regain, relapse of weight, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe the plication, it works a lot. Uh, pretty much like the sleep, the first, I don't know, the first years. But afterwards, it tends to, um, the restriction is not there the same as it was at the beginning. So I started gaining weight. And then I went keto. You, you explained me the keto and uh, 
and the benefits and the, well, I look them in, in Simti and you, it, it worked. So I started keto and low carb and then I went back again. I went down again. So, so as you can see, yes, all surgeries have a tendency to expand all surgical procedures. It's just the nature of the beast. I mean, you eat, you expand the stomach. And as you expand the stomach, as food passes down on a daily basis, it pushes on that stomach and it starts to expand to a certain point. That's why we've redesigned surgery. Uh, for many years, we've been using the strengthening of the mm -hmm. stomach wall. We call that the double buttress technique and uh, reinforcing the wall. We micro calibrate uh, our surgeries. That's why we call it the improved gastric sleeve. And even with application, that's, uh, we use the same principles. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, counteract the forces that are being uh, active each time you eat. So that expansion sooner or later is going to permit you to eat a certain amount more of food. But like you said, your excess weight, if it was reversed, it was reversed because you weren't doing the right things. And the problem with Definitely. people that have weight loss surgery and regain the weight is mostly because their carb content is extremely high. Uh, most people eat around 50% of their food is comes from carbs in a day. And it's not basically their fault. It's simply because there's nothing else available in modern uh, food industry. Most of our food is um, carb-based. So whatever you're eating, you, either it's grains, it's sugars, it's processed sugars, it's processed grains. Um, the processed oils, which basically I just described the ingredients of anything processed food. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's the American shopper oh. shops for purchases and eats over 50% of their food is processed food. Um, so if there's one message, one takeaway message from these webinars is stop eating carbs. Uh, stop eating carbs. Just diminish your carb intake as much as possible. Most people will eat 200, 300 grams of carbs a day and don't, don't even notice it. One half of a hamburger bun has 25 grams of carbs. If you, you want to be in ketosis, which means that you become an effective fat burner, you have to be below that. Now, carbs crave carbs, fat burns fat. Cra Carbs crave carbs, fat burns fat. Everybody who says they're addicted to carbs, they're addicted to carbs because they eat carbs. Once yeah. you stop eating carbs, you won't be addicted to them. Now, you've gone through that phase. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, the beginning was, um, was difficult because everything was different, right? I used to eat carbs all the time and since I was a kid, so I, I didn't know any other way. I thought if I get fats, I'm going to get fat, no? But it's the opposite, as you explained. Fat burns fat. So um, at the beginning, it was difficult. I, I spent like, instead of going in and out the grocery store, I, I spent like two hours reading all the labels, you know, because obviously if you don't have carbs anymore. You need to get what is going to be instead of. So... I, it took me a long to learn all that, but right now I pretty much go always low, low, uh, low carb. And but, it's not di it's not difficult. You just have to be weary that carbs are everywhere. So yeah, and you're always counting, and as long as you don't eat more than twenty per day, and and the good thing is right now there are other options like uh, non-sugar chocolates, for instance. If you eat a regular chocolate, it could have like 16 grams, and but the no sugar chocolate has 1.8. Same with the ice cream. So it's not that you're not having that at all, but it's just that you, you make your choices. So, so for me, it's, I got on low carb uh, probably five years ago. 
after seeing the results with all our patients, uh, and impressive results, like I said, over 10,000 patients being prepped for surgery two to three weeks, I, we've seen up to 60 or 70 pounds weight loss in the, those two to three weeks. It's impressive. And uh, we have cases where well, one specific case out there that hopefully he's watching, that this guy started off with 60 units of insulin. That's a lot of insulin. And uh, Lucia, our, our chief nutritionist, was in, in contact with him. But this guy's like really, really religious about following our guidelines, right? So on day one, he starts his uh, pre-surgery plan, pre-surgical weight loss. And what he does is he, uh, on that first day, he does the nutrition plan. And at 1, 2 in the morning, he's dialing Lucia because he's having this extremely low blood sugar. So he calls also his uh, primary care physician in, in the US and the doctor says, well, cut your insulin by half. So he doesn't. The next day, again, his blood sugar is extremely low and he's freaking out. So he finally cuts it by a little. And then the next day, he's still in low blood sugar so he cuts it a little bit more. On the seventh day, he actually gets off insulin. Yeah. And, and this is unheard of. Even the, the doctor was like, what are you doing? It's like, well, I stopped eating. I'm just following this program. And really, our program is a modified Mediterranean diet. It's a low-carb Mediterranean diet. You eat a lot of uh, good fats. You eat a good protein, etc. But you don't eat sugars. Now, if I use my example, for me, the easiest thing to do is don't go over 20 grams of, of carbs per day. That's not as challenging as it sounds. Obviously, I don't eat bread. I don't eat pasta. I don't eat rice. I don't eat grains. I'm Mexican, but I don't eat beans or tortillas. I finally found some tortillas that are made of, of, of uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, normal maize, normal corn. But they're so thin, they're paper thin, that each one has six grams. So that makes me so happy. <laughs> um, and, and there's alternatives. So, so you were talking about chocolate as an alternative. What other, what other alternatives have you found? Well, as you say, no bread. Well, at least no bread from regular flour. No? It could be almond flour or more grains on it. So um, basically... No tortillas, no bread, because I used to go to the tacos stand and everybody's like, and I came with my fork and my knife, <laughs> just having the meat, you know, because I didn't do tortillas. So now something that's catching on is that uh, many taquerias are, are doing the tortillas out of cheese, burnt cheese. Yeah, yeah. And, and you eat it. And that's beautiful. So anyways, we have some questions uh, online on Facebook that are asking 20 what 20. We're talking about grams of carbs. Now, anybody who counts calories, calories in calories out, that doesn't work. That's been a myth. That's been a lie. We've been fooled. We've been lied to. Okay. So counting calories doesn't work. Uh, low calorie diets don't work. Don't work because you're going to lose whatever, but you're going to regain it and with a vengeance. Uh, what works is cutting your carbs. You can eat impressive amounts of fats, but fat will not make you fat. It's the carbs that make you fat. Because the carbs are the ones that intoxicate your liver by every time you eat a carb, you create this insulin response because insulin is produced in order to be able to metabolize the sugar you're eating. The sugar goes into your mouth, it goes into your intestine, it goes to your bloodstream, and then insulin is released by your pancreas, and then that brings in the sugar back into the cell of the liver and of the muscle and everywhere else. When you eat too much sugar, which is everybody, two things happen. You're constantly producing insulin because you're eating all day, six meals a day, like they tell you, which is the stupidest thing in the world, <laughs> and you become resistant to the insulin but insulin is is an anabolic drug it's the best drug to make you fat it's the best uh hormone to make you fat so if you're constantly promoting the release of insulin by eating carbs 
well, you're going to become fatter and fatter. And no, not only do you become fatter because you, you, you accumulate more fat because the carb turns into fat, you're also intoxicating your, your liver, and your liver is the main processor of carbs that keeps your body with enough blood sugar when you are not eating, like, say, at night, for example. So if you're eating so many carbs, your, your liver becomes so full of sugar that it becomes a fatty liver, and then you start having dysfunction. All of this stuff that we're talking about causes metabolic syndrome. It, for, for, for me to explain it easy, easier, what we should be eating is at least 50 to 70% of the energy we eat in a day should come from fat. Another 20%, maybe 30% from protein, and only 10% from carbs. And when I, people say, what are carbs? Carbs are sugars that you find in food. I'm not even talking about processed foods. I'm talking about car carbs. Sugar, it, uh, fruit is full of carbs. But it's also full of fructose, which is a, which is a type of sugar. Uh, if you are going to try to control the, how many grams of carbs you eat in a day, what you should do is really simple. Eat leafy greens and vegetables that grow above ground. In other words, food that has fiber. Leafy greens and vegetables that grow above ground. That should be your carbs. You can eat as much as you want. Apart from that, you're done. That's your okay. carb load. Everything else should come from fat, from healthy fats. Now, what are healthy fats? Healthy fats are fats that are not manufactured by man. Plain and <laughs> simple. Keep away from processed oils, right? Now, notice, for anybody else that's looking to find a good rule of thumb, what else? What about grains? What about quinoa? What about nothing else? You're done. Eat leafy greens and vegetables that grow above ground. And especially guys tell me, I can't eat X, Y, and Z. No, you can't. But let me tell you what you can eat. In the evening, you can grab this beautiful steak. Uh, lean steak, doctor? Uh, no. I want you to eat a fatty steak, like a ribeye. Okay. How much fat? Well, take that fat and then steal the fat that your wife has on that plate and put it on your plate. Mm -hmm. And then add a glob of butter on, on there and then put some nice uh, sautéed vegetables on the side, no roots, uh, and uh, Don't maybe the avocado. some nice avocado on your um, leafy greens, and bacon, uh, bacon and uh, some eggs, and grilled oil, eggs, and drizzle some olive oil. Does that sound like a good meal? And everybody's like, yeah, dog, I didn't know I could do that. Well, that's what you should be eating. That's a healthy meal. Now, the other thing is that this, all this nonsense about eating uh, meat is going to uh, kill you or make you diseased, it's been all proven to be a lie. Yes, if you're eating diseased cow, of course you're going to get sick. If you're eating cow that's eating pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers, is in contact with plastics, well, yeah, of course you're going to get diseased. So this is, why, this is what I recommend to all people. Eat local, eat fresh, eat grow, local. Your, grow your own or know your grower. What does that mean? Go to your local, uh, su um, not supermarket, but farmer's market. Look the Mexican in the eye and ask him if, he, if he's spraying your food with toxins. Why the Mexican? Because Mexicans are growing your food. So give me a break on that one, right? So go to your lo local farmer's market. Don't go to a super uh, market store or whatever because they don't care about your health. They're going to eat, uh, buy whatever, and they're going to sell it to you. You don't even know who grew it. Eat organic. Or eat organic. Extremely important because you will void yourself. You will prevent from eating pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers, like I said. Eat leafy greens and vegetables that grow above ground. Eat proteins from animals. Uh, eat cow or poultry, or even fish, that's or organic. If a fish has to be wild caught, preferably. Why? Because the farmed ones, unless they say otherwise, are usually fed grains. Grains are always sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, especially herbicides. Roundup, the weed killer, there's so many studies on that. And eat fats. What are the good fats? Anything that is not processed 
oils like vegetable oils. Eat good fats. What's really good for you? Butter, preferably organic. Ghee, which is the clarified butter. Avocados, nuts. Careful, peanuts are not nuts, right? They've got a lot of carbs. Certain nuts have more carbs than other ones. Two fistfuls. Um, and all the fats that come in an animal uh, protein. So I don't know, uh, you kind of followed our guide for years now. So what, what do you recommend when somebody's asking you how to go low carb? Well, the, um, as you say, my breakfast was always um, eggs fried in bacon. I mean, in butter with bacon, avocado, and some grated cheese. And that's a very low carb breakfast. Then maybe some uh, protein with cheese and for dinner. You know, when I'm on keto, I try to fast as well. So I stop eating like at six in the afternoon. Otherwise I want to go to the bathroom all night. So I got like 6 p.m. So I have some maybe, uh, you know, the pork, uh, right? the chicharron with guacamole and that's my dinner. Yeah, chicharron, chicharron is pork rinds. So yeah. uh, pork rinds are, are new chips, right? So yeah, that... they have zero carbs and all you can eat and uh, they are very tasty. And with guacamole, what else do you want? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all, an all fat, uh, that's spectacular. So one of the things that's happened is when we have these international meetings here uh, at Obesity Control Center, uh, we've got a lot of industry tr wanting to collaborate with a new project, the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine. And we have these meetings at these uh, 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 big meeting rooms. And you know how typically in, it's in the morning, so there's coffee and then you have your cookies and stuff like that. And that's what typically all these suits, right? All these executives expect. But every time they come with us, it, it's so interesting to see that they're kind of shocked uh, initially, and then they're kind of digging it because when they arrive, the first thing they're going to see is organic coffee, right? So, an organic coffee, and the only thing they can add to the organic ca coffee is either stevia, uh, which, which, or organic stevia, which is naturally extracted from the stevia plant, which is a leaf green, a green leaf, I'm sorry, and uh, heavy whipping cream with no sugar added, of course, uh, which is heavy cream. And, and they're like, Okay, that's pretty different <laughs> because you always typically see non non organic coffee and then the pink little or the yellow or the blue envelope, right? Mm -hmm. Just crap. People don't eat that stuff. It's chemically modified sweeteners that are going to kill you. It's already been proven that funky metabolites will circulate after you have those uh different types of, of sweeteners so if you're going to use a sweetener use stevia i mean it comes from a it's an extract from a leaf um and then well that's all good and well they go back to their table and we start the conference in the conference room but after a while 10 in the morning well it's kind of getting a little hungry and that's by the time that people are looking around to see for some cookies so never <laughs> cookies never bread never donuts n n that's just so many carbs so what we do is when the food comes, uh, the, the uh, break, um, when they go to the table, they find pork rinds, guacamole, which is everybody knows that it's uh, avocados with like uh, tomatoes and onions, stuff like that, that are mashed up. And then we have nice uh, solid cheese. Um, and then we even have strips of bacon dunked in in uh, dark chocolate and these guys were like oh man this is crazy and so they're all wearing their suits and their ties and but later on they're all crunching on the on on, on the pork rinds and enjoying their in fact uh, one of these meetings i had several months ago i see these people two months after or a month after and i'm like holy moly what you do to yourself man Hey, I followed your plan and I've lost uh, 17 pounds. So some guy lost 35 kilos, which is 70 plus pounds just yeah. on lowering their carbs. In fact, I have somebody here that says after surgery, their uh, diabetes reversed, which is 
beautiful. That's very important. But they, they're saying that their cholesterol is still high. Now, HDL is the good cholesterol. LDL, you can call it the bad cholesterol. But the truth is what your best marker is HDL, the good cholesterol. And if your blood sugar is low or normal, if your insulin is normal, your HDL is going to be higher. And she's asking, how can I elevate my good cholesterol? Two things, eat healthy fats, diminish your carb load. Two most important things is to have a good HDL and a low triglyceride. And the only thing that can do that is by lowering your carb intake. So even though you had weight loss surgery, you have to lower your carb intake. And the other thing that uh, impacts your HDL is exercise. Have you been exercising? Uh, not uh, as much as I want. You know, this year has been difficult. But we go to the park and we walk a lot, maybe down to the beach with the dogs. And so it's, it's not like exercising per se, but I've been trying. I was going to start swimming this year, but I don't want to go in the ocean to do that. Well, one of the things that I started doing is I'm using the X3, which are basically the principle of rubber bands. So I'm using these different type of rubber bands. It's spectacular because it takes me 11 minutes to do my workout. And uh, I actually had in, in our series, uh, Stay Home, Stay Healthy, Ben Bocchicchio. It's online. It's on YouTube. You guys can uh -huh. refer to that video. I interviewed him for an hour. And he's, we're explaining how his principle is actually the best way to exercise that has the lowest rate of injury and the highest rate of lean mass growth. It's three times the gains of normal weightlifting or other types of exercise. And it's really simple. It's you're using strength either to pull or to push against a constant tension created by a rubber band, really by bands. And when you're starting to, to push or to pull, well, there's really no uh, resistance. But as you're extending or as you're contracting, then the resistance grows exponentially that's why you don't hurt yourself because when you're con fully contracted or fully extended that's when you can hurt yourself and that's why weights lifting weights can hurt you mm -hmm. the other thing is that you this workout is just one ro single routine so say for instance if we're doing chest you're going to do chest until you go to failure and that can be 15, 20, 30, or 40 pushes. And when you go to failure, you're done. That's the end of the exercise. So typically, my routine is 10 minutes, uh, 15 mm -hmm. minutes, and you're done. That changed my life dramatically. So I I'm recommend gonna do you doing that. There's I'm going to copy you again, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> There's, well, ask, ask Cynthia, because she's the one that found it. So we have another uh, question if patients only get carbs through vegetables and continue to be very strict on eating healthy will the weight loss be quick and able to be maintained no carbs no flour no sugars just protein and veggies uh no because just protein and veggies people are afraid of fat and fat is the most important uh element that we're missing in our nutrition so, no, it's not protein and veggies because you're eating carbs and proteins that can be turned into carbs, right? You have to eat fat because fat is not only essential to every single process in your body, including structural, not just protein, but fats are involved in everything. Fats are also involved in brain health. Fat are also involved in all the processes, metabolic processes, all the hormone synthesis in your body. It's impressive how fats are so important. And one of the things I always tell patients is like, you ever heard of essential fats? Oh yes, essential fats, uh, short fatty acids, uh, omegas, yeah, perfect. You ever heard of essential uh, amino acids? Oh yeah, proteins, the amino acids, 10 of them. I think the amino acids, they say it's uh, the, the elements that create the protein are called amino acids. And these amino acids, well, 10 of them are not produced by the body. So you actually have to eat them. Okay, that's good. Have you ever heard of essential carbs? No, they don't exist. You can live with a, without a single carb all your life and, and never have a problem. So 
fats and proteins are essential and fats are extremely important to be eaten because you need them to survive you need them to uh, thrive so I would change this I like what she says she says no carbs no flour no sugars perfect no grains no processed vegetable oils right no processed foods in general eat leafy greens and vegetables proteins preferably organic and eat fat what are your fat sources what, what, what well, typically, what are your fat sources, Efren? Well, the same from, uh, I cook with uh, lard, pork lard. Lard? Lard lard is wonderful. I use a lot of bacon as well. Okay. A lot of avocados. And uh, what else? Well, I think the, the pork uh, rinds have a lot of uh, fat as well, right? Pork rinds have some fat, yes. And exactly. a lot of butter as well in the morning, a lot. Butter. So, so one of the things that we've been looking into is uh, I, we believe in, in results that we've seen over the past 10 years. Um, and what we've seen is that our objectives have a positive impact o on the overall health of patients in as little as two to three weeks, even before surgery. I've always recommended decarb, detox, and replenish. Decarb, meaning lower your carbs as much as possible. Your carbs should come from leafy greens and vegetables. I'm not going to get tired of saying this. Uh, detox. Your food should be organic. Now, it's not as difficult as one would think. Toxins, 90%, 90 percent, 90 plus percent of the food we eat has pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers. The most prevalent toxin in our food is called glyphosate. It's better known as Roundup, the weed killer. The weed, the weed killer has been directly associated to obesity, diabetes, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, clinical depression, autism, uh, ADHD, and the list goes on. A direct correlation, and for those that like science, look at a study published in 2013 called Entropy by Dr. Stephanie Seneff and Anthony Samsel. That's when this whole revolution started. Now there's something called the Detox Project. You can go there and learn more about how our food is tainted with weed killer. Now the weed killer I'm talking about is a direct descendant of the Agent Orange from the Vietnam War. It's chemically uh, a family member, and it's been directly linked in, 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 in early 1980s, 1981 to be exact. The EPA studied the use of glyphosate, Roundup, the weed killer, in our food. And there was a study done in rats, and uh, when the study was finished, uh, these fa uh, rats were given chow, rat chow, laced with Roundup, 20 parts per million to be exact. And many of the rats got cancer, thyroid cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular cancer, uh, 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 breast cancer, et cetera. Um, so those studies are there and they're being republished by MIT. But what, what that led to is that they actually hid those studies. And right now, luck would have it that if you ask how much did those rats eat, 20 parts per million to get cancer, you know how much our food has on average of Roundup, of weed killer, 20 parts per million. And in fact, mm -hmm. the, they're l lobbying with the government to get that dosage doubled. So you know how the government is spectacular in saying, oh, we can tolerate up to so much of rat crap in your food. And it's like, no, I don't want any rat crap in my food or, or cyanide in my food or toxins in my food. Well, it's all about we can tolerate this much, right? Um, so, so something that's very important is the detox, detoxing of your food. How do you do that? Eat organic, grow your own, or know your grower. That's the most important thing. People say, well, it's expensive. Well, it's going to be more expensive to cure, try to cure a cancer yeah. or diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And ultimately, if we all pull together and, and become one single voice, the more demand there is for a product, the less price it's going to cost 
once the demand is there. So everybody should be eating organic. And in a world of online shopping, you can always have the alternative of shopping for your food online. One of the difficult things is to find certain foods that are organic, like pork, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So like I was saying, you've got uh, D-carb, detox, right? Eat organic, grow your own, know your grow, and replenish. What am I talking about? Replenishing your gut. One of the most important and unique uh, science developments in the recent years has been that the reason we are sick is because we've killed off the bacteria, the good bacteria in our gut. And not only in our gut, we've killed it off in the dirt. So dirt, soil, has bacteria. It's a living organism. Soil is a living organism. So is our uh, gut uh, microbiota, which is the gut bacteria inside our intestines. And that one is very dependent on what we eat. If we feed the bacteria in our gut, a living organism within a living organism, we understand that living organism poorer than we understand the cosmos. But it is well associated, it's well known that if you have a good gut bacteria, you will not develop those chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, many other chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, etc. Uh, autism. It, if you do have the bad bacteria, then you're going to develop a ton of those. And how do you keep a good bacteria fit? Well, number one, give it, give it prebiotics, in other words, fiber and other types of elements uh, that are part of our nutritional plan. And feed more bacteria into your gut. How? By eating organic foods, by not washing the hell out of your foods, especially if they're organic. Uh, don't put them in disinfectants, just remove the visible uh, dirt, etc. And by feeding yourself on non-processed foods. So it's these three principles that will dramatically change your life. Now, exercise is not for weight loss, exercise is for longevity. Uh, do you take probiotics? You take uh, sh also shakes, right? Yeah. Yeah, and right now I'm doing the free of diet, actually. <laughs> because I gained some weight again, and uh, I'm trying to do keto again, but I'm starting doing the free of diet. And yeah, I take my shakes and pro pro probiotics as well. So, so a, a lot of questions right here. So somebody's asking, what's the best way to wash veggies and fruits? Uh, uh, salt water can actually be a great way as long as they're organic. If they're not organic, then you're putting yourself at risk for uh, many contaminants. And like I said, the, the worst ones are the chemical contaminants. And then somebody asked me, so are you against eating beans and legumes? No, I'm Mexican. I would love to eat beans all day long, but you know how many beans I can eat before I've gone over my 25 grams of carbs per day, quarter cup, then I won't be able to eat vegetables. So you said it, Efren, you, you got to, you have a decision to make. I'm not yeah, against eating working. anything. What I know to be true is that if I combine the amount of carbs that we eat and the amount of toxins that we eat, the end result is diabetes, the end result is metabolic syndrome. The end result is stroke, is cancer, is cardiovascular disease, it's obesity. Nine out of 10 people have some type of metabolic syndrome in the United States, adult population. I'm not against anything. What I am saying is that if we've seen that lowering your carb intake uh, down to 50 grams per day even better down to 20 grams per day, reverts metabolic syndrome, well, you're also going to revert all the stuff that happens due to metabolic syndrome, like obesity, diabetes, cancer, and all the other related diseases. So the best thing you can do is change the way you think about food. There's a really good website out there. Uh, they actually have half a million followers now which is dietdoctor.com. Andreas Enfalt, uh, he was the one that caused the uh, butter shortage in Europe because he started with this keto diet. And in fact, this keto movement was started by scientists uh, much like him, 
Uh, another scientist is Dr. Tim Noakes. He was the guy, he, he wrote the runner's guide on how to carb load, and then suddenly he became diabetic, and he said, oh, my God, I'm wrong. So he rewrote his book, and he said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Don't carb load, fat load. And, uh, and he's controlled his diabetes ever since because he's changed the way he thought about carbs. Carbs aren't your friends. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not, people start asking me, it's like, wait a minute, but many years ago we used to eat carbs. Now we've been eating uh, <clears throat> carbs for uh, sugars, processed sugars for less than 100 years. We've been eating processed food for less than 100 years. There's a great study out there. I've got some beautiful slides on it. Uh, that correlates between how long we've been eating processed foods between 1880 and 1910 we've been eating sugar we've been eating processed oils like Crisco and some other some of these uh, oils and uh, <coughs> vegetable oils vegetable oils and some other of these manufactured oils aren't made in a kitchen they're made in a <coughs> in an oil plant in a manufacturing plant this doesn't look like a kitchen at all and when they finally come up with the product it looks like gray snot. And then they have to pass it through electromechanical uh, uh, filtration in order to make it look like oil. Why do they do it? Because it's cheap to produce. So mm -hmm. if you're going to look for oils, look for oils that have not been treated physically with temperature. And the answer, to be simple, is it has to say cold pressed. What are the only cold pressed ones you can find? Olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil. Those are the oil, your go-to oils. Don't use seed oils because they've all been treated either to stabilize them chemically or with physical temperature. Once you start changing the nature, the chemical nature of an oil, that's when you start creating oils that are overabundant in our food. And I have to ask everybody, people that eat out all the time, which is most of us, do you really think they're going to be cooking your food in ghee or in clarified butter or in high temperature safe oils like avocado oil? No, they're going to use these vegetable oils that are extremely uh, uh, unstable. And these are the things that are causing disease between this and the amount of processed sugars and the processed flours that we're eating, all those three, processed sugars, processed fats, processed flours, that is what 100% of the makeup of processed food is. And eating processed food is going to kill you. Uh, if you're going to go shop, go around the edges of the market. Don't go into the aisles. That's going to keep you safe. So where do you, where do you buy your food? Um, well, it depends in uh, some, some I can get in the grocery store, um, but some of the, uh, like meats and everything with the butcher, local butcher and the lard as well. Do you, do you cook, uh, do you bake like using almond flour or coconut flour, stuff like that? If I'm, if I'm just uh, low carb, yes. Oh, only almond or nut, um, what's it called, uh, pick and nut uh, flour. But if I'm on keto, I, I try not to get any flour because I don't know, I, I, it just doesn't work with me. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of those things that uh, I've been talking to a good friend of mine. Uh, in fact, uh, their, their, their group is called uh, Low Carb MD. Dr. Brian Lenskis, and he says, you know what, if you're using substitutes for flour and stuff like that, you still haven't got it. Stop eating bread, stop eating sure. pasta, stop. Once in a while, yes. You know what I use? I'm going to use maybe eggs and psyllium husk uh, and then thicken it, th thicken it up and use Philadelphia cream cheese. And then you make this paste that magically turns into this dough. And mm -hmm. then I just use two pieces of wax paper. I flatten them out with a roller. I put them in the oven 15 minutes and there's your lasagna. Then you cut them with a, uh, a pizza cutter and then I make these, spe I'm actually, I actually, okay, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to go make some lasagna right now because <laughs> I'm hungry. And that's spectacular <laughs> lasagna. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this recipe uh, live uh, from the house and share it because it's spectacular. You can also find it 
right there at uh, low carb MD. Uh, but once in a while, yeah, I'm gonna go for these substitutes, but I really try to eat as natural as possible. My meal, like say for instance, yesterday was, I made some short ribs, and what do you, how do you make some short ribs? Well, you get the short ribs, they're organic, you saute them, you put mirepoix, which is um, celery, uh, onions, carrots, and then you saute them in there, then you put half a bottle of wine, you cover it, and four hours later you take it out, and I'm using low, completely low carb rice. What is that? It's called vegetable rice. It's a rice made out of vegetables uh, because it goes very well with it. Uh, it's the classic way to eat your, your mm -hmm. uh, short ribs with a risotto or with a rice. Uh, but right there, I'm saving myself, I don't know, hundreds of ca calorie, I mean, car uh, grams of carbs because rice, a quarter cup has like 35 grams of carbs. Yeah. But with this rice, which is called a, a vegetable rice, uh, spectacular, you find it online, you find it on Amazon, at least once in a while, I'm gonna give myself those treats, but I try not to do it that often. Like I said, I'm also using these tortillas that are called Thinkredibles, but you rarely find them because they're extremely thin, but they're tortillas, man, and um, I, can't, I can't be <laughs> anything else in Mexican, so. So um, how, how are we doing on, uh, on time? I think uh, we have... Uh, 11 or two. So garbanzos, lentils. Oh, cheeses. Somebody asked me about cheeses. 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 <laughs> uh, you know what? Cheeses, cheeses have different types of carb content, but ultimately there is this great... When you think about food, you have to think of where the food comes from. So everything comes from, from the soil. And from the soil, you either have a tree or you have a plant, and then the animal eat, eats the plant and you eat the animal or whatever the animal produces. So the healthier the animal, the healthier the food derived from the animal, either if you're eating the flesh of the animal or actually the cheeses produced by the animal. What cheeses are great, anything that's fatty is great, uh, if it's organic, even better. There's still not the trend of organic cheeses simply because many of these cheeses are actually organic in, in the sense that they are so well produced because much like wine, they don't use any chemicals, they don't use any external uh, influences except everything natural because they don't want to change the nature of the cheese, the art form of creating something that's delicious that has a specific taste etc many of the french cheeses italian cheeses they're not made in these huge companies they're 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 made they're made almost in these small little farms uh, uh etc these cheese uh, cheeseries um so so y you want to find artisan cheeses and you want to find uh, different cheeses but there's charts out there that tell you which cheeses have more carbs and less carbs and which have no no carbs at all so definitely cheeses are also something that gives you the ability to cook low carb high fat because some of these recipes actually use a lot of cheese to be able to create the fattier the fattier the better no yep yeah of course the fattier the fattier the, the cheese the better um so anyways uh what do we got um uh we have another question says uh, the patients with Viva no bypasses challenge for Dr. Uh, or, uh, a challenge for Dr. Ortiz organic shade grown coffee. That's a conservationist in me. It's out there. Check on Amazon. Beautiful. Uh, Mindy. All right. She's online watching. Uh, so there's another organic coffee. She's mentioning the shade grown coffee. There's another organic coffee called uh, Leaf and green tea company, something like that. It's Mexican, it comes from Mexico and they sell it at Price Club or Costco, whatever. Uh, and it's these big, huge tubs. So that's where I buy my coffee. I buy organic coffee and then I grind it and then I drink coffee every day. Now coffee has 10 health benefits and no negative health benefits unless you're extremely sensitive to um, caffeine or you don't drink organic coffee because after Petroleum, organic, is the second most traded commodity globally. So it's full of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers, etc. So you want to drink organic coffee. And by the way, no, if you go to your local Starbucks, only 4%, last I heard, 
of their coffee is organic. Don't be fooled. Sustainably grown and uh, best practices and stuff like that has nothing to do with organic. That's not going to keep you alive. Keeping yourself away from the toxins in the food is going to keep you alive. Keeping yourself... Now, <clears throat> one of the things that is happening in the recent uh, guidelines in internationally and in the United States, and scientists, several scientists are now pushing to name sugar as a toxin. You heard, you heard it right here. Sugar, a fructose, is a toxin. Yeah. And, and even though it abides inside fruit, people rarely eat fruit anymore. Uh, so, so sugar, fructose, is in all the processed food, it is a toxic substance. For the first time in history, non-alcoholic hepatic liver disease, fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is happening in adolescents and young adults um, and uh, in, in older ages as well. And it's associated to eat the consumption of fructose. So these people are heavily diseased and they will die if they don't dramatically change uh, the amount of sugar they're eating. It's important. And it's more addictive than some drugs. And of course, we said uh, carbs crave carbs because of the simple fact you eat a carb, your insulin level goes up, it metabolizes your sugar, then your sugar in your blood drops and triggers your hunger. And there you go again. Doctor, I can eat, I'm eating constantly. Why? Because you're only eating sugar. Change to fat and you're not going to be wanting to eat in a day or two. Now, have, you've experienced that, right? Uh, when you're eating fatty food, yeah. you, you can stop eating for a day and suddenly it's like, oh, oh yeah. my God, I've, I've skipped a couple of meals. You know what? You don't do the, the three meals per day. You just, I'm feeling hungry. You eat something, then you start fasting until the morning after. So it's easier that way, I believe. But the first time I went keto, when, when you uh, introduced me to the keto, I lost 40 pounds with keto um, in seven months that I went keto all the way. I was thinking of uh, doing my application retouch, <laughs> but with this is so easy and you feel healthy and you, everything. Yeah. Exactly. For, so for those, uh, you always want to check, even if you've had weight loss surgery, you want to check what you're eating. Keep away from carbs, keep away from toxins. And I've got a couple of questions of <clears throat> pre-surgical patients. So I want to say hi. And one of them says, Doc, uh, what about a little, a little small amount of red wine before surgery? Go ahead. I'm not going to tell you not to. Uh, truth is, uh, a glass of wine has one, two grams of, of, of carbs. So really, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, and, and the physical effects, the, the, let's say the mental effects it has can be extremely positive because it... It is, it's an anxiety lytic, or it diminishes anxiety, it diminishes nervousness, etc. So it can be positive for you. And somebody else is asking, can I continue to drink my coffee till surgery? Yes, you can. If you're a coffee drinker, go ahead. Again, if you drink coffee, drink organic. Stay away from anything else. Sweetener except stevia. And last but not least, if you add milk to it, eat only add heavy cream, not whole milk. Whole milk is full of sugar, right? Also and almond milk, right? The one with no well, sugar. Well, here's the problem. Almond milk has sugar in it too, especially if it's sweetened. So that's why I go for the heavy cream. Unless you are completely intolerant and then you have other options like macadamia milk and almond milk. But if not, go for the heavy milk. That it's beautiful. Heavy milk is awesome. Heavy, heavy cream. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. So you became uh, now one of our patient care coordinators. And yeah. it's always a pleasure to have you. You schedule a lot of patients and you help them not only release their anxiety as they talk to you because you're pretty funny with them. Uh, you're also an ex a great example to follow because you've been through it. You've had your struggles even after having weight loss surgery, but you've regained your health and you're an example to follow. So, Efren, any last words before I go back yeah. to surgery? Thank you very much again, doctor. And again, uh, this is pretty much because of you and Cynthia and uh, the whole, whole 
team and uh, whoever is willing to do this, let us know. We're here to help you and uh, the sooner the better, you know. Some people is pushing this back because of the COVID-19. Well, patients who had surgery in March, they already lost a hundred pounds, some of them. So, yeah, ex exactly. So, so just, just last, last words of, of our philosophy. Our philosophy has always been to provide the best possible uh, procedure. Uh, and we're not just talking about procedure, we're talking about a program. So as you know, our program is a pre-surgical weight loss and a post-surgical weight loss. We have an education program online for everybody watching that has had surgery or is thinking of having surgery or is already scheduled. Our program is gonna be back up online in the next number of weeks. And it's an automated program that has over 400 videos and pieces of information that I just said, but in organized fashion that's gonna take you from A to Z from what science is talking about what regarding nutrition. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of noise out there, and we've tried to make it easy. One of the most important things is we have seven world-class physicians, including two physicians here from San Diego from Low Carb MD. One is uh, Dr. Brian Lenskis um, and their new practice, Low Carb MD. Uh, we recorded over 40 videos with them, and the topics are basically how, to, how, how they recommend people should eat and it's beautiful it's great it's so informative and it's what our program is it's not just weight loss surgery for those thinking of weight loss surgery or those family members that are thinking of weight loss surgery don't go for price if you're already going out of the country like with us we already have a less overhead cost so basically surgery is pretty affordable but people are going trying to save a, another I don't know, a buck or two, and they end up in the worst places where surgeries are not done correctly, and then they end up having to be redone here like we've been doing in the past number of days. And that's a very unfortunate fact. You're buying into a program. This program is not just surgery. It's pre-surgical preparation and a five-year follow-up. And in fact, uh, I think it's right now is a good uh, good a time as any. We're introducing our ambassador program. Our ambassador program are those that have already undergone weight loss surgery and have passed the basic and advanced course that we are providing online that we will be providing very soon. Why are we doing this? Because there's no better inspiration than somebody like Efren who has this before picture, this after picture, and they've gone through the, the steps and they have the knowledge and they're there they can give advice but they've walked the walk and now they can talk the talk so our ambassador program has a diploma it has a small little uh, medal that you can put on your social media sites and you will be basically uh, let's say supported by the fact that you are knowledgeable in most of the areas that modern science uh, has to offer regarding nutrition and weight loss. That's, I think that's extremely important because we want you guys to be influencers because oh, I, I don't want you to send more patients and if you do, it's all right and good and well with me. But ultimately what I want you to do is influence others to learn about this metabolic syndrome um, epidemic and change their ways because we want to save lives far before somebody has symptoms. And the only way to do it is by being vigilant, by changing the ways you look at food, modern food, processed foods, and what really is good nutrition. And unfortunately, there's so much noise out there that we really have to do take a course. All right, I think we're out of time. I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank, thank Efren, and we're gonna do this more often. Thank you. Gracias.